Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs> The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you and grant that they may know and understand what things they ought to do and also may have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. A reading from the book of Amos. This is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with a sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words, for thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, Go, flee away to the land of Judah, earn your bread there and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees, and the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Now therefore hear the word of the Lord. You say, do not prophesy against Israel, and do not preach against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus says the Lord, your wife shall become a prostitute in the city, and your sons and your daughters shall fall by the sword, and your land shall be parceled out by line. You yourself shall die in an unclean land, 
and Israel shall surely go into exile away from the land. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the people of God. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> the psalm appointed to be read this morning is Psalm 82. We will read it responsively by the whole verse. <clears throat> God takes his stand in the council of heaven. He gives judgment in the midst of the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show favor to the wicked? Save the weak and the orphan. Defend the humble and, and needy. Rescue the weak and the poor. Deliver them from the power of the wicked. They do not know, neither do they understand. They go about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. Now I say to you, you are gods, and all of you children of the Most High. Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, and rule the earth, for you shall take all nations for your own. A reading from Paul's letter to the Colossians. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters of Christ, in Christ in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. In our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. You have heard of this hope before the word of the truth, the gospel that has come to you, just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, so it has been bearing fruit among your, yourselves from the day you've, you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. This you learn from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may lead, worthy, lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the, in the knowledge of God, may you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power, and may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while, fully, while joyfully giving thanks to the Father, who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the people of God. Thank you, to God. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Christ. A lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. 
And Jesus said to him, You have given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. If only the gospel were less understandable. Yeah, I know that sounds strange. A more usual complaint is that the words of Jesus are hard. They're not understandable. But you know, I'm really not sure that for most folks that's the actual problem with our Lord's words. As someone has said, it's not the parts of the Bible that he doesn't understand that trouble him. It's the parts he does understand that trouble him. You know, there are some parts of the gospel of Jesus that are so plain, they trouble us because their meaning demands something of us. And this is certainly true of our lesson from the gospel according to Luke this morning. A lawyer comes to Jesus wanting to know the way of salvation. And he has done really well in answering Jesus' questions of him regarding the law. And seeking to gain further favor, he pushes the discussion on by asking Jesus a timeless question. Who is my neighbor? It's a question that's as old as the first brothers on the earth. Am I my brother's keeper? Cain was seeking to justify himself. In effect, this lawyer is asking, whom am I really obligated to love? as much as myself. Is it my spouse? Does it include the people who live on my block? Is it limited to those who share my dialect or live on the same soil? Certainly it couldn't include a Mexican or a Central American or a Cambodian or a Middle Easterner. Perhaps he hopes, as we might, that Jesus will answer with one of his more obscure parables, a word that will leave him and us 
free to make our own decisions about what sort of claim it has upon us. But not this time. Jesus' parable leaves no room for misinterpretation. A certain man, he says, went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who robbed him and left him for dead. By chance a priest and then a Levite happened by, but left the man there as they passed by on the other side. But then a Samaritan came by. He had compassion on the man poured wine and oil onto his wounds, bound the wounds, and then brought him to an inn where he paid for his recovery. The lawyer had expected Jesus to say that a neighbor was a friend, or at least limited to an Israelite. But Jesus had now expanded the definition to include foreigners, even heathen ones, hated ethnic groups on top of it all. The man had wanted a word of confirmation that his limitations on love were quite satisfactory. That he was justified in his views and actions. But Jesus instead spoke the heart and mind of God. Deep in our heart we know the mind and heart of God as well. We may not always like the claim that that puts upon us. Jesus' understanding may not always be in perfect accord with the way we cast our ballots or speak our minds or don't speak our minds. And yet we know what it means. Knowing, however, does not always mean doing. When I was in seminary, a revealing experiment was performed at Princeton Theological Seminary. Twenty of my classmates were instructed to go to a recording studio on the university campus and make a tape recording of their interpretation and understanding of the Good Samaritan story. A second group of 20 seminarians, also my classmates, were told to go and do the very, to the very same recording studio to participate in a career study program. They would give a talk on their future career and idea of ministry. In both cases, as they met in separate classrooms, a great deal of stress had been made upon them as to how important their preparations and talks would be for their future career chances, both in the church and in academia. What my classmates did not know was that the whole thing was a colossal setup. They were to be the key components in a study being conducted by the graduate psych department at the university. A professional actor had been hired to stage a heart attack as the seminarians walked along the route from their classrooms to the recording studio. As the students walked by, the actor clutched at his heart and gasped, Oh, this is a big one! And he toppled over onto the ground. Sixty percent of the seminarians did not stop. They trudged on to keep their appointments for their career advancement with that recording studio. As the final report of this study appeared in the Journal of Human Behavior, it reported, and I'm going to quote this, some who were planning their dissertation on the Good Samaritan literally stepped over the slumped body as they hurried along. Interestingly, there was no significant difference in compassionate behavior between those who had the parable on their mind and those ready to talk about their future careers. End quote. Ouch. Not one of my alma mater's finest hours. But most of us here understand don't we? We have heard the Samaritan call of Jesus. 
and we have attempted to give our lives to those most in need of compassion. And yet, even we, at points, have played the priest and Levite. We are oriented to sharing compassion, so much so that it is those points of failure to share it that we most keenly remember and are most sorrowful for. It's not easy to be always caring. Need is always there, calling out to us. We have neighbors who are hurting. Some are refugees just looking for a place to be safe, to build a new home. Some are immigrants, legal and otherwise, from Central America who work our fields just trying to get by. Some are folks in distant and some not so distant lands who are just trying to eke out a living from the soil. And then there are those who live right around the corner. And not just the poor or the elderly or the handicapped. Not all compassion needs are our physical needs. Some of the loneliest Angriest, most desperate people live in very fine houses and drive very nice cars. But they are no less in need of compassion. No, the need for compassion is always upon us. The crush of the world's need can feel so overwhelming that we can come to suffer from what has been termed compassion fatigue. What, what an amazingly accurate term, compassion fatigue. It happens when we simply feel tapped out. It happens most to the most compassionate, to the caregiving, to every deeply caring person, sooner or later, more often than we would care to think or admit, so what can we do? What do we do when the well of compassion in our hearts is so drained as to have run dry? Is there a way to recover in this, from this compassion fatigue? Well, yes. Recovery all has to do with the one who has compassion on us who refills our empty wells, who restores our ability to pour out compassion again, the one who works his compassion in us and through us for others. A former classmate of mine, one of those who got tripped up in that now infamous Princeton study, is pastoring in Iowa these days. He shared some time back about his own battle with compassion fatigue. It happened in his very first parish in Springfield, Ohio. And I share what he wrote. In my first parish, I wasn't paid well, but the farmers in the congregation saw that my wife and I were well fed. Sometimes the overabundance of some seasonal foods approached getting out of control. In the tomato season, we had plenty. Carol learned every possible way how to cook and preserve tomatoes. We still had too much left over. One day I took a peck of those tomatoes to a third floor of an apartment house where a very poor family lived. After carrying it up three flights of stairs and walking down a long hall, I came to a screen door that had the screen half torn out and flies flying in and out. I'd been there many times and knew that there were five children and a mother whose husband had deserted her. One of the little urchins came to the door dressed in her underwear and screamed to her mother, Mommy, Jesus brought tomatoes! I've never forgotten that little one's comment. And he goes on to say that to this day, 
his whole ministry has been transformed by the fact that he is expected to be Jesus for other people. And he doesn't mean that in some self-aggrandizing way. He means it as Martin Luther did when he said that all of us are called to live our lives in such a way that we become, as Luther termed it, little Christs to our neighbors. You see, compassion isn't all up to us, whatever's in our reservoirs that day. It doesn't all depend upon how we happen to be feeling ourselves on a given day or time, whether those personal wells of good intent are feeling all full and brimming over or the last bit wet out just an hour ago. When you and I seek to give compassion to another in need, we are not doing it alone. Jesus is there with us in that moment. He supplies his own compassion through us. His healing presence actually comes into that moment, flowing through you and me. Your act of compassion becomes as truly sacramental even as the Lord's presence comes to us through the elements at the altar. So his compassion and presence comes to others through you and me. If you can let your mind wrap itself around that truth, he will re-energize re your compassion. You see, it is Jesus who makes us little Christs for others. Jesus' parable this morning leaves no room for misinterpretation. The message of the good Samaritan is unmistakable. Nowhere are we more reminded of that than when it is us, when we are the strangers who are left lying by the roadside. It may be a time of physical weakness. It may be a business failure or a marriage breakup. It may be grief over the loss of a loved one. But there comes to us all those times when we feel ourselves beaten and left for dead. Suddenly, we hear words of encouragement. Then we feel gentle arms begin to lift us up. Somehow we become aware of a strength that is not our own. And we know that somehow we are going to survive after all. The living Christ has come to us himself in the person of a good Samaritan a little Christ. That is the life to which Jesus' parable calls us. In the strength of his compassion, working in us and through us, we now are his hands and his arms, his presence, his Samaritan. We don't need to ask the question, whom should I love? We already know the answer. Be the Samaritan, the little Christ, the presence of the Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our trust in God by reciting the Nicene Creed together.
We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. For our prayers of the people, we will use Form 6. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work. For our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alive. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Ann and Peter, our bishops. For Rick, our priest, and for all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God in his church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation, we especially pray for... Marion Seyfried, Bob, Bob Love, Love, Jimmy, Jimmy Trotter, Trotter, Karen, Karen Ferguson, Ferguson Micheline Martin, Martin, Lindsay Hicks, Don and Nancy, Nancy Gwarick, Mary Floyd Sigmund, Ezra Robertson, Jan Cardwell, Jody Underwood, Betty Sigmund, Jean Horsley, Peter Pottle, Nancy Scott, Reed Tony Craddock, Bob Campbell, Hazel Post, Chris Constable of Agate, Cody Thompson, Thompson Robert, Robert Greer, Greer, Gary Strader, Larry Turner, Turner Joan Zdansky, Brenda Denson, Joyce McCloskey, Dot Cunningham, Daryl Washburn, and Judy Juan. Lord, have mercy. And we also pray for all those serving in the armed forces of our nation, especially. Randy Williamson, Ethan, Ethan Rogers, Rogers, Heather Meyer Guyana, Jericho Guyana, Bo and Patty Fay, Renee Wilson, Ralph Lee Clayton, Michael McCloskey, Ben Shepard, Wesley Welch, Lathrop Smith IV, Jim and April Doniker, Chris Miles, Robert Murray, Caleb Butt, Hunter Morrell, James Perry, Jonathan Romero, Prayer Father and Hannah Drew. Lord, Lord, protect them from harm and shield them in danger. Hear us, Lord. For your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We thank you for the marriage of Caitlin Miles and Dan Klein, the 40th anniversary of Father Rick and Dion Miles, and for Megan Miles Tuttles whose birthday in 
Megan Miles Tuttle's birthday in whose celebration the altar flowers are given. We pray for those celebrating birthdays this week. Richard Piazza, Sarah Cobb, Priscilla Foster, and Chris Rogers. Lord, we thank you. We will exalt you, O God, our King. We pray for all who have died that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Through the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Uh, just just a, a little correction there. Uh, all of that stuff about us, of course, was last weekend, and uh, we, weren't, we weren't trying to sneak in double billing. They are our flowers the second week, but, but uh, we just missed the fact that it was still in there, so sorry about that. Um, the, this last... Uh, Wednesday, of course, was our first Wednesday of the month, and it was a great crowd. There were at least 40 people there, and a lot of good time, a lot of good food, and, and so we encourage everybody to come out uh, the first week of August as well for the next one. One, one thing that we're uncertain of uh, is we, we heard something this morning that possibly Bob Cook is going in for surgery tomorrow, uh, potentially prostate surgery. I'm going to check that out as soon as possible after worship today and get word back and out to everybody. But in the meantime, in either case, whether it's so or we were misinformed, do pray for him and for Sandy. Um, you know, it's like an old professor of mine used to say, always stay prayed up. You never know what's coming. <laughs> so d they will enjoy the prayer. So do pray for them. Uh, are there any other announcements this morning? Let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn, to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you and your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. And sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, 
All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you've given us to do to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord, to him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Alleluia. Alleluia.